Well, good morning again, church. Thank you for being here with us. And it's funny sometimes what songs will jog your memory and for what reason. And when he was singing Forever, that's written by a guy by the name of Chris Tomlin. And most of you, if you've been saved long enough, you know that name. It should ring a bell. And it takes me back to when Courtney and I were dating. We were working at Highland Lakes out of the camp. And, and uh, Chris Tomlin was instrumental in starting a church in the Austin area called Austin Stone. And when they were in the beginnings of, beginning, of starting that church, they came and did a leadership meeting out at, at Highland Lakes. And we got to dinner one night during the retreat season, and, and uh, you know, I learned a long time ago, before I even worked at the camp, you don't make the cook angry. Right, Tony? No. Never make the cook angry. Don't, don't, you know, don't do that. It's bad for you, right? And uh, the guy that worked the kitchen at the time at Highland Lakes, uh, his helper was named Aaron, and this is who had this interaction with Chris Tomlin and Aaron. And Aaron was a guy that, he was very cut and dry, and Aaron was one of those, you know, and in, in to phrase it, if you just think America or America, it's Aaron. Like, he's just that guy. He's just, but he's a good guy. And uh, we got to dinner that night, and the way it worked in retreat season is you could have first, and then after everybody that was there that weekend had their first, then you could come back and get some more. And I distinctly remember, partly because it was lasagna night. My mom made us a lasagna this week. But we were doing lasagna, and they came through first, and they ate their dinner, and Chris Tomlin walked back up with his plate and wanted seconds, and everybody hadn't eaten yet. The other groups hadn't come in. And he asked for seconds, and Aaron, he goes, sorry, can't serve you seconds yet. We got another group coming. Once they're through, you can have as much as you want. You know, we'll just turn the spoons around. You serve yourself. You know, I know that's weird now. You think about serving yourself. It's a no-no. But he said, you can have as much as you want after these other groups finish eating, and, and we'll turn it loose on you. And then Tomlin kind of looks at me and goes, you know who I am, right? <laughs> and Aaron, without missing a beat, goes, yeah, you're Chris Tomlin, but you can't have any more lasagna. Go sit down. <laughs> And we all died laughing. And, and Tomlin was doing it, joking around, trying to be funny, and Aaron just didn't suffer fools. And so it was one of those that sometimes you get an inflated sense of ego, and it always takes just that one person to sort of make you realize you're just a human that walks around on two legs like everybody else. So be careful. When we think about that, we think about this week as we get to Ruth chapter 4, as we look at finishing out Ruth this week, and we think about where we've come to this point. We're really looking at the genealogy of Jesus but we had to do the pre-work to get to where we needed to get to today with Ruth chapter 4. We had to do uh, the, the beginnings of this to get to where we wanted to get to in chapter 4. And we think about this and we go back and sort of a brief re recap of what happened. Uh, Naomi and her husband Elimelech move out of Israel uh, because of a famine. They, their sons marry Moabite women and then they have to move back. Uh, the, the boys, the husband and the two boys pass away. And so Naomi and Ruth end up moving back to Israel. Now, Naomi would have been an Israelite. Now, of course, she would have been looked at a little sideways because she had left. But Ruth, uh, Ruth was a Moabite by birth. And so she would not have been as well received. But we think about this. And why did Ruth come? We, we think about the commitment Ruth made to Naomi in the beginning in Ruth chapter 1 where she says, where you go, I will go. Uh, your people will be my people. And what we look at here is that Ruth had fully committed not only to Naomi, but to what Naomi believed. And so when we think about what's going on here in Ruth, it's that Ruth has not only become Naomi's daughter-in-law, but she's become a sister inside of a relationship with God. You know, Naomi, Ruth is trusting in the God that Naomi knows. And she's trusting in that, and we see what happens with that. And then we get into uh, chapter 2, where Boaz, as we've said before, goes strong to the hoop and makes it very clear that he is interested in Ruth with what he does as far as what he allows her to do in, his, in, in the fields. And then last week we talked about Ruth's reply to that, where she showed up and sort of said, hey, I saw you noticing me, and I noticed you. So like we noticed each other, right? That's, that's not scriptural. That's me paraphrasing, so don't go looking for that. But uh, that's basically what's happened here. They sort of had this beginnings of that flirtation type relationship, right? If you've ever been in a relationship, you, you kind of have those moments, right? Where you notice someone from across and right in the Disney movies, the, stuff, the lights look the right way, the music is the perfect crescendo, everything is so perfect, and then you notice each other across the room, right? That's, they've had that moment, and, and Ruth lets, lets Boaz know that he is the kinsman redeemer and desires for him to protect her and, and follow up with that like he is supposed to do. But he says, yes, I want to do that, but there is one closer than me. There's a, a kinsman or demon that's closer in line to the family than I am. So we have to handle that first. And as we talked about last week, this is the same day as we look into three and four. As we come out of chapter three and come into chapter four, there's not a lot of time that has passed here. It's basically become morning, right? What happened in chapter three happened at night in the threshing floor. We come to the day of chapter four right after that night. And Boaz is going to handle this business that day. 
And you remember we talked about this last week, the idea of waiting for the right moment in things, but at the same time, when that moment comes, be ready to move, be ready to go. And so Boaz is going to have this moment, and he knows there's a kinsman redeemer closer. He knows he has to get that guy's permission in order to redeem Ruth and marry her and do what he wants to do. So he's got to figure out what he's going to do here. We think about Boaz in this situation. We think about what he's done to this point, right? Well, in chapter 2, whenever he saw Ruth in the field, he didn't just sort of say, hey, she's pretty, I like her. What did he do? He went out of his way to take care of her, right? He first thing he did was told, was told her, hey, you know, don't, don't worry about, just follow my young women, stay where they're at, they'll take care of it, all the way up to just basically telling them, hey, just leave her the good stuff on the ground and she'll come pick it up later. Right? He, he's really gone out of his way here. And so he knows that he's got to go talk to this kinsman redeemer, this other one. But he also knows that this guy's going to be really interested in the land. Because that's the thing is it's not just Ruth. Where Boaz, what we hear about here, is Boaz is interested solely in Ruth and taking care of Ruth and Naomi and wanting to do that because he cares about Ruth. He's fallen in love with her. But there's some land associated with this too. The lands that would have belonged to Elimelech, to that family. And he knows that this other kinsman redeemer is going to be interested in the land, but you can't have it both ways. You can't have just the land and then not take care of Ruth. If you're going to do one, you got to do both, right? And so Boaz is figuring out how this is going to work. And so we get into chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat there. Soon the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. Boaz called him by name and said, come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten men of the city's elders and said, sit here, and they sat down. Now this wasn't uncommon. Boaz wasn't worried about a fight here. What he was doing was just making sure there's witnesses. That as we do this and we figure this out, we want to make sure there are other people there that can say, hey, I was there. This is what happened, right? We call this covering your bases, right? Making sure. That's what he's doing. So he said, and he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the land of Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you, buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do so. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know because there isn't anyone than you to redeem it. And I am next after you. Of course, the, the person says, I want to redeem it, he answered. Then Boaz said, oh, by the way, right? So we pause here and we look at what's happening. Boaz explains the land and says, hey, it's just you. There's nobody after you. I'm next in line. So if you want the land, great. And the guy responds quickly. Hey, I want the land, right? You think about it. If someone came to you today and said, hey, got 50 acres. I want to sell you cheap. In fact, it's basically yours already. And you hear that, hey, 50 acres. You're not probably not even thinking, where is it? You're just thinking land, right? Cheap land. Want land. And so he says that he wants to redeem it. And then Boaz replies with this. Oh, on the day... That you buy the land from Naomi, you will also will require acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. And so you see what Boaz did here, right? He buried the lead, right? You would think in this situation that the first thing that would be mentioned would be, hey, there's this woman that you need to redeem and take care of, right? No, what did he do? He went with the land first. He got this guy's sort of attention with the land and then said, oh, yeah, hey, by the way, there's this other thing. And, you know, it's kind of a big deal. And so he says on the day, you know, he tells him that, that you will require, you will perpetuate the name. The Redeemer said, I can't redeem it myself or I'll ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption because I can't redeem it. You have to imagine at that moment that Boaz is sort of like secretly doing his happy dance, but he doesn't want to show that he's excited about it. Because when we go back and look at this in the original language, if you go back and read this, the way Boaz sort of talks as we break down the original language, is he sort of kind of playing shy with it? The way we see it there is he's sort of saying, well, you know, if you want to, you know, but there's this thing and, and you'd have to do this too. And, and I know it's going to be hard for you. He's, the, the language sort of puts in this idea that he's sort of playing coy with this guy, sort of saying that, you know, I don't know how well it's going to work, but I mean, it's there if you want it. But if you don't, I mean, I'll, I'll, t I'll take that burden, Right. Right? It's like when somebody brings a really good dessert. We'll just use Jeannie's cherry pie as an example. You know, whenever that cherry pie is here, and I'll tell you all the time, you, you don't want to eat it. It's not very good. Like, just leave it alone. Right? We'll take care of it. We'll, we'll, we'll bear that burden for you. Those of you that have been around here enough know that I'm basically telling you it's delicious, and you should eat all of it that you can, right? And, and so that, you've seen that, right? Kids, we're great. Kids do that. Adults, we're great at that, right? We sort of come to somebody and we're like, well, I mean, you know, 
I'll do it if I have to, but I'm not real excited about it, right? I'll, I'll eat the cake, but, uh, you know, but um, so he does that, and the guy says, he can't, he can't redeem it, I can't do that. And as we looked at that, the Redeemer, you know, this, this other Redeemer basically was saying he couldn't take that burden on to his own family. That there was something else stopping him from doing this. He didn't, have the, he didn't have the ability to do it. And so Boaz here really gets what he wants, right? Boaz gets what he was wanting the whole time. And what I love about this when we look at four is this is really the first time we see Boaz say anything about the land. And he's not saying it in such a way that he's interested in it for himself. This entire time, Boaz has been interested in Ruth, not the things that come along with it. And so it speaks to me in two ways, inside of a relationship in a marriage between a man and a wife, a husband and a wife, that we're not interested, you shouldn't be interested in what someone brings on the outside scope to the marriage as far as possessions or degrees or money. It's about the person, caring about the person. And we see that here with Boaz that he cares about Ruth. And the other side of that is between us and God, right? What is it that we can bring to God that gives value to him? Nothing. We add nothing of value to the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if anything, we are, we detract, we take away from the glory with our sinfulness. But here's the thing about God is he doesn't look at us that way. He looks at it as he cares about us and wants to take care of us and send a redeemer in the name of Jesus for our sins. God's not worried about the other issues because he knows that Jesus will take care of them. He will cover them if we simply admit sinfulness and believe. And so when we look at this, this is leading towards the eventual birth of Jesus, setting up the, the earthly genealogy of Jesus. And so we see here that already that story is being told about what Jesus is going to be, the type of redeemer that Jesus is going to be. He's going to be the redeemer that cares about the heart of the matter, not the fringe benefits. He cares about the inmost being. So we see in seven, at an earlier period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. This was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. Now, I'm not one to take away from contract law, but I believe this would make life a lot easier, right? If you didn't have to go sign, if you went to buy a house, I mean, what is it now? A hundred something pages, Sean? I'll just recently had to go through it, right? But a bunch of stuff. You're just signing your name over, sign over here, over here, over here, right? You don't even, anybody actually take time to read all that? Yes, no? Yes. The lawyer, the, Sean and the lawyer, right? That's, that's the two. Everybody else is like, I don't just, yes, 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 right? Would it make life easier if it was just like, hey, just, you know, take your boot off and give him your, your right boot and you're good, right? You're done. That's the end of it. So that was the, the, prox the, the transaction back then. That's what happened. So the Redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, buy back the property yourself. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Chilon, and Malon. I will also acquire Ruth the Moabite as Malon's widow as my wife to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his home. You are witnesses today. And so our Boaz here does the right thing. He makes it legal and it instantly, instantly states his intention. Today, Ruth is my wife. Notice there, he doesn't say anything. He says, yes, he's going to get the land, but he cares more about Ruth. This is the part he's excited about. It says then in 11, the elders and all the people who were at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful and Ephraim and famous in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son of Tamar, born in Judah, because the offspring of the Lord will give, the offspring of the Lord will give you by this young woman. So they're pouring a blessing upon this guy, trying to bless this union and what's going to happen here. And so then we see in 13, Boaz took Ruth she became his wife, and when he was intimate with her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has left you without family redeemer today. May his name be famous in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. So we pause here for a moment, and we see, now I haven't had this experience yet, but from what I've heard from a lot of you, the birth of that grandchild is a big deal. 
right? Like you love your kids. I'm not saying that you don't, but every person I've ever talked to that's a grandparent says there's something different about that grandchild. There's just something there. And as I say it, my mom's sitting right here with one of her grandchildren. There's something different there. You can see it, right? I don't know if it's just the fact that you can play with them all day and then send them home, right? You can sugar them up real good and then just send them right back to home and like, ha, live with it, right? You can buy all the toys that make a ton of noise and leave them at their house. I, I don't know if that's, if it's vengeance on the parent to the child. I don't know what it is. But every one of you that has grandchildren, when I, when I see you talk about those grandchildren, you just, there's a difference. You light up different. You're, you never, I haven't had a single grandparent that I can think of that's come to me like, well, my grandchild is worthless. Right? All of them are like, man, my grandkids are doing this, that, and the other. Like, they're about to fly to the moon. They're, they're this, they're that. They're everything that I'd ever hoped they would be. And so we can imagine how Naomi feels here with this grandchild. What she's been given and this blessing poured upon this grandchild. And we see what's going on here with Ruth. And so it says in 16, Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and took care of him. The neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So we see here, we see in this book of Ruth, we see how God has orchestrated this relationship between Boaz and between Ruth, using Ruth as sort of the, the focal piece of this to begin the genealogy of Jesus. And who Ruth is shouldn't be lost on us today. Because the Israelites, the hardcore Israelites, the hardcore Pharisees and scribes, those religious people, right? we're not saying say the religious ones, those who studied the law and thought they knew better than everybody else, they would have looked at Ruth as someone who wasn't worthy enough to be used. They would have looked at Ruth as someone who shouldn't even be allowed to be around, shouldn't even be inside the system of Israel, because she's not good enough. Yet God takes that one and places her at the beginning of the genealogy of the ultimate redeemer. God showing here that no one, no one, is at a place where they can't be used by him. That God can use whoever and whenever he wants to accomplish his goals, including us today. We think about ourselves, right? It's easy for us to come down on ourselves and think, well, what do I have to offer? What do I have to do? A lot. Because if I can't teach you, if I don't teach you anything else, let me teach you this, that if God puts someone in your life that you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with, then you've done more for that person than anyone could ever imagine. If you could share who Jesus is with someone and help them understand why they need a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you've given them the best gift anyone could ever give. It's not always about standing up in front of thousands of people, preaching in a stadium, or leading worship in front of those people, or being those things on TV or whatever. It's about looking at the people to your left and right, your neighbors, your family, Sharing Jesus with them. We see what happens here. Ruth, who was willing to just follow Naomi and trust in what Naomi was doing, and ends up in a situation where she becomes part of the beginning of the genealogy of Jesus. Now, did Ruth see the, the, that to fruition? Of course not. She was gone before Jesus came. Uh, she was gone before David was born. But when we look at this line, it begins with this relationship between Boaz and Ruth, and it sets up not only the greatest line of leadership in Israel's history, it sets up Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. Right? Twofold here. Not only does Ruth see, become part of the seed of David, who is the greatest king Israel sees. Israel is never stronger than it is under David's leadership. Farther down the road, it leads to Jesus. And so when you think about those things that you can offer unto the world or unto others, realize that it may look little at first, but long term, the consequences could be bigger than you could ever imagine. The example I've used with this before is nobody really remembers the name of the man who led Billy Graham to Christ, but they remember Billy Graham. Does that mean the man who led Billy Graham to Christ was less important than him? Absolutely not. We think about that, that when God calls us to something, we don't know what the long-term repercussions of that is going to be. But we have to trust that 
God knows exactly what he's doing. Because we see this as we come to the end of Ruth chapter 4. We see now this genealogy of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram, who fathered Abimedad. Abimedad fathered Nalon, who fathered uh, Salmon. Salmon, if you want to call it. If you want to go with the Hebrew, there would be like a, a very heavy saw there. Solomon who fathered Boaz, Boaz who fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, and so on and so on and so on. We can get to Jesus. And so when we look at Ruth, it's easy sometimes for us to sort of get caught up in this story between Ruth and Boaz and the love story of it. But when you really get in the story of Ruth here, you've got to get right here to the end of chapter 4, where you see where God took the one who everyone would have said wasn't worthy and used her. To bring the one who was most worthy. And so my challenge, not only for myself, but for us today, church, is for that. Is for us to understand that when God is calling us to something, we don't always understand what's going to happen. We don't always know what the end game is. But I know that if God's doing it, it's going to end well. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, that's absolutely step one. We study this whole thing and... You're thinking, well, how do I be used by God? How is God, God going to use me? Well, if you haven't accepted him as Lord and Savior, that's step one. The Bible tells us clearly that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. But that's step one. There's a relationship and building that comes after that, but it just tells us that's what leads to salvation. And if today you understand that you're a sinner and you want to talk about that and understand more what it means to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, I would love to talk with you about that here in a few moments up here. If you're watching on YouTube, you can email us or message us through that. But maybe we're also here today and we've accepted Jesus, but we find ourselves sort of weighing in our minds, what could we do or we're not good enough? Let me tell you this. None of us are good enough. God is good enough. I'm not good enough to stand up here in front of you and deliver messages. I'm not. I'm human. I'm sinful. I get angry with my children. My wife and I fight. I'm honest with you, right? Charles and I have been working out in, in my gym, and he can tell you that I'm not always the funnest person to work out with. <laughs> Weights are heavy. It's not always fun. We ran Lytle this last week, and when I say ran Lytle, we left from Charles's house, if you know where that is, and we went down by the White's house, which is basically running all the way down Main Street, and then we doubled back. We weren't, I mean, we were having an okay time doing that, but we weren't exactly, you know, running around rejoicing, running down line, right? It's difficult. We were sweating. I'm human. But God working through me is perfection, just as it would be through anyone. And so when I come stand up here and I, and I do these things, it's not me thinking about how great and wonderful I am, it's me just revealing or understanding the fact that God is doing something that I can't do on my own. And it's the same thing in each and every one of your lives. God will work through you to do amazing things. You just have to trust. And so if you're here today and you find yourself sort of thinking that, well, I'm not good enough or I'm not this, you're right. I'm not going to fight you on that one. We're not. None of us are. But God is enough. And if you allow him to work through you, he will accomplish and do things that you couldn't imagine. You'll see amazing things happen. You just have to be willing to let him work. With that in mind, let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the example of Ruth and Boaz, who not only committed to each other, but God committed to the plan you had laid out, that you had put together. And through that, we saw the amazing things that happened to the ultimate redeemer in Jesus Christ. That the one who would have been called unworthy in Ruth was deemed worthy by you to be a part of this plan. God, we think about all of our lives. And in our humanity, we are all unworthy. But you make us worthy through your sacrifice. You do amazing things through us. Because you are amazing. God, I pray for those today that may not have yet accepted you, that they would do that. They would step out in faith and admit sinfulness and begin that relationship with you. And that they would ask the right questions, come and talk to me or talk to someone around them, God, and, and ask what it means to be saved. And begin that relationship, begin to know you and grow in your, in your love. God, for those that are struggling with being good enough, 
pray that they would turn that over to you. They would trust you because you are good enough. God, we thank you that you are good enough and that you sent the ultimate redeemer in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with us, church. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being there. If you haven't yet, please like these videos, subscribe to the page. That way you'll always be updated on what's going on there. Uh, if you're in the Lytle San Antonio area, we'd love to have you join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. Uh, remember, we love you. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, we hope to see you in person soon. Until then, stay safe.